still see that kind of thing. Sitting on the floor, ear shooting down my face, my body shaking, hearing those thoughts in my head. I don't belong. I'm not good enough. Everyone will be better without me. I still see that moment where all hope, all ability is gone. My mental health journey started when I was five years old. I was a competitive cheerleader, got in at this most painful uniform, and my stomach hung over my skirt. And someone close to me who I was up to, who I loved, and was just like that person. She made a comment about my body. And from that moment, five years old, something about me wasn't good enough. And something I couldn't control, I'm five years old. I became afraid of growing. Five years old, I was afraid of growing. Something we all have to do as humans. And I started to spiral constantly. I had to be perfect. Growing up then, in school, I had to have perfect grades. I had to be a perfect cheerleader. I had to be super happy in front of the world. I had to be this idea of what a perfect was. But inevitably, one test is a little too hard and you don't get that hundred. A new cheer scale is a little too hard and I fall on my face at a competition. Small things happen that make me constantly feel like I'm not good enough, I don't belong, and they would be better off without me. By the time I was 12 years old, I was completely convinced that I wouldn't live there I didn't want to be here anymore. Want to talk about it. But in middle school, what happens when you talk about something that no one's talking about? People teased me, made fun of me, made me feel so alone. So I started to walk. Vlogging wasn't really a thing back then. It was almost 15 years ago now. And I just had to talk about it. I called it Inspiring My Generation. And I thought, maybe I can inspire my peers, my friends, my loved ones to talk about it. To talk about something that helps them get through their day to talk about how they're feeling, what they've gone through, hoping that maybe someone else would understand a conversation would happen, and we'd get through it together. It didn't really happen. So when I turned 15, I told myself, maybe they're just not hearing me. So I started a podcast. It was called Blog, Blog Talk Radio back then. Podcasting wasn't a thing yet. But I knew I had to talk about it. That was way ahead of my time but I just kept trying. And then I got to high school, and everyone's asking you who you're gonna be, what you're gonna do. They wanna know the rest of your life, and I didn't know who I was. I didn't know that I wanted to be alive. I didn't think I was gonna make it this far, let alone see five years down the line, 10 years, 20 years. It became so overwhelming. In the midst of that, my parents separated, and that piece of safety that I had suddenly felt like it was gone, and I didn't know what to do. And everything started to feel so much more difficult, and so much more isolating. Went away to college, convinced that, just get through college, you're gonna graduate, you're gonna get a job, life's gonna work out. Well, it's not actually that easy. I went away to college with my grandparents, my grandfather, my best friend in the world. They sent me three times a day. Every morning for a cup of coffee, every day on my way back from school, anyone who was in his barbershop chair at 9.35 Monday, Wednesdays, or 1.35 Tuesdays, Thursdays, knew that they were gonna have to stop and hear about my day. Their haircut did not matter for just the day it mattered. Dinner, no matter who he was with, what he was doing, he made sure to FaceTime me so that I knew that I was important. Three weeks, before I'm about to graduate, not only was I about to graduate, I was gonna graduate in two years. I worked so hard to prove I was good enough, and the people who helped me do it, my grandfather, my grandmother, who stayed on FaceTime with me all night, anytime I had to study for an exam, crying, trying to explain these finance formulas. She didn't get, I didn't get, neither. But she was up to do it with me. Three weeks before that graduation where Life's suddenly going to get better, where I'm going to show them that because of them, look at what I've done. They get into a car accident. I lose my grandfather. I almost lose my grandmother. And everything inside me shatters. I didn't know how to keep going without them. I didn't know how to get through a cup of coffee in the morning without my grandfather, let alone a lifetime. And no one was talking 
talking about mental health. No one was talking about grieving or coping skills. So I didn't know what to do. My grandmother was in the hospital for a while. I slept in a hospital chair next to her, did not leave her side. We were gonna go through it together. My best friend in the world. But Christmas came around, Christmas Eve, and a day that we would spend together, the three of us would snuggle in bed before Christmas Eve so that we could watch The Grinch and drink cappuccinos with the phone. That was never gonna happen again. And all these emotions flooded and hit me. I didn't want to be there anymore. I didn't know how I was going to get through that moment. I attempted to end my life on Christmas Eve. My uncle was the one who helped me do it. 27 days later, I lost him to suicide. And my heart shattered because when he had that conversation with me, he understood what I was going through. He knew exactly what I was feeling, but he didn't tell me. And that's when I realized how important conversations were and how important it was to talk about it. But again, when I tried to talk about it, no one around me knew what to say. They said, it's fine, you're fine, right? You don't know what to say, you don't know what to say. And my parents, terrified, because what do you say when your child tells you they don't want to be here anymore? You know what to do. I would do from my master's program at the time, moved in with my aunt and her cousins, tried to do everything I could to take care of them. Two months into that, no sleep, not eating, not taking care of myself, not being there in any way for myself or paying attention to my own mental health. And I ended up in the psych ward after two more attacks. And in the psych ward, I saw how many other people never had that emotional support that they needed and never had a conversation that no one ever said, how are you? And looked in their eyes and made eye contact and wanted to actually give that answer. How many people never had a chance to learn about coping tools, about something that could help them get through those hard moments. And I realized I needed to do something about it. But I didn't get any new tools while I was there. They weren't telling me what to do. They were just keeping me safe for 72 hours. So I felt like I had to figure it out myself. I was 12 years old at podcast I was 15, and I decided I was going to do something to have conversations. I was going to give the conversation that support, that awareness, that information that no one gave me, that I desperately needed, to someone else that hopefully would help them before they got to that point. Starting my generation, now 501c3 for suicide prevention, awareness, conversation, education, and support. And when I open my eyes now, I see the future. I see all that I've been able to do, and all that I can do, and all that we can do as a community, as people, to make sure that everyone has access to support. I started a podcast. On that podcast, I've had conversations with people from around the world. I realized that the voices who are talking about mental health tend to be the same voices getting the platform over and over again. And I thought, how can we make sure that everyone's voice is heard? How can we make sure that people from around the world, no matter what you look like or where you come from, no matter what your experiences are, you can feel seen and heard to make sure that people know your story. Because everyone's story matters. Everyone has something to say. Almost 190 episodes have come out already, and I've learned so much. You saw us on an upcoming episode. I'm very excited about it. We've donated handmade cards to patients hospitalized in the psych ward. I had that moment in the psych ward where everything was dark and cold and there was no color. I asked them for grants and they said, well, we don't have the budget to actually be able to do arts and crafts outside of the designated time. Because if you lose a grant, if you lose a marker, that's it, we don't have any extras. It was dark, there was no color, there was no light, there was no hope in a moment that I just needed light, color, hope, something to look forward to. So, to keep myself alive for the first year, I started creating these worksheets 
and coloring pages and letters to myself, just hoping myself to stay alive, telling myself that I belong, that I'm enough, that I matter, that I'm worthy, I belong, it's going to get better, keep going. And I made sure I told myself those messages over and over again. But one day I had a hundred cards in front of me, hundred letters, hundred coloring pages, and I thought, maybe someone else needs this. What if I had received this back then in the psych ward? And coming out of the psych ward, I knew that I wasn't alone, that I could talk about it, that I could have a conversation, that it could get better. So I started donating them to the psych wards, and now this month we will hit 20,000 handmade cards. Wow. Um, wow. bringing those tools back to kids who need them because our schools aren't talking about it. So how can we get that information to them? How can we make sure that someone growing up, when someone makes a comment about their body, when someone makes a comment about their hair, their face, anything, their shoes, how can we make sure they know not to let that define them, that it does not define them? How do we make sure people know when they look in the mirror not to start complaining about their eyebrows or their hair or what it looks like, right? How do we get people to look in the mirror and say, I love myself. I'm so grateful to be alive. I'm excited to be here. I have purpose. I have a future. I love being alive. How can we get that going? So I started creating conversations. And then I, in the psych ward, Again, I didn't have those tools. So when I came out, it's like work, I mentioned those coloring pages. I started creating these guides for myself. Because what do you do when you don't know what to do? In those dark moments, they came again. I didn't come out of the psych ward and suddenly feel like I wanted to be alive and life was perfect again. I felt like I didn't want to be here. Why am I still alive? Why didn't it work? What do I do? So I started creating these guides for myself, things I could reference when really tough days came, and then turn them into a workbook. So that first workbook, You Were Not Alone, that is the workbook that kept me alive that first year. And every year I've been able to create new tools. Now why have I been doing this? Again, conversations. It comes down to making sure that everyone knows that they're not alone, and that hope is available, and there's things they can do. So, what about people who never talked about it before, who never learned about what can I say, how can I check in, how can I make sure my loved one knows that when they talk to me, I'm there, I care, I'm listening, I want to support you. So I made my five step guide. Step one, checking in with yourself. Take a minute and close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. Deep breath out, open your eyes. How are you really? How are you really? Step one is checking in with yourself. Paying attention to how you're feeling. What do I need in this moment? Am I ready to be there for someone else? Or am I going to take some time and focus on what I need to do to get through? Step one, checking in with yourself. And when you decide, I'm ready to be there. I'm ready to support someone else who's struggling. Step two, ask non-judgmental open-ended questions. Make sure people know that you want a conversation. Not, are you okay? How are you feeling today? What's been on your mind lately? Let's talk about it. Not a yes or no question that can end with yes or no. A question that inspires conversation that inspires support during actively listening with understanding statements. Making sure when someone's talking to you, you're making eye contact, you're facing them, you're making sure that they know you're listening. You're not looking around and them feeling, am I burdening them? Do they care? Can I talk to them? Am I upsetting them? Making sure they know your focus is on them because you care. 
And then my favorite part is the understanding statement. Making sure that people know that you understand and you want to understand. And clarifying, because what someone else says might not be what you're understanding, what you're hearing. So clarify. What I'm hearing is if you're really upset because you had a bad day at work, at school, someone made fun of you, the test was a little bit harder than you expected, you missed the deadline. Clarify, why are you upset? What emotion did they say? Repeat that emotion back, making sure you really understand what they're trying to say. Four, validate feelings. Letting people know that their feelings are important, that they matter, that they're not traumatic, that's what people told me, dramatic. You're making things up. You're seeking attention. You make sure people know that it totally makes sense that you're feeling that way. No wonder you're feeling that way. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. It's okay to feel anxious. It's okay to not know what you're doing. And then follow up. Because sometimes when we open up, have you ever opened up to someone and maybe question afterwards, should I have said that? Did they care? Can I talk to them about it again? Yeah, I do that a lot. So, sad. follow up. How can I make sure someone knows that you can talk to them again? Maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's a text, maybe it's a FaceTime. Maybe it's sending a person and saying, Thank you for reaching out to me the other day. I'm here if you want to talk again. It's okay not to be okay, but I'm here for you anytime you need some more. How can we make a difference? How can we save lives? Where does suicide prevention begin? For me, it all began with a conversation, and I'm so grateful and honored to be able to have a conversation with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you.